first up is Harriet Deacon, who's the Visiting Research Fellow at the Ferguson Center for African and Asian Studies at the Open University. And Harriet is going to give us a global rundown on some of the challenges around the convention and how different countries are approaching it. Harriet. Thanks very much, Joanne, and thank you for inviting me here. I think it's very exciting that this uh, symposium is happening, and uh, I look forward to a, a lot of further discussion on these issues. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, some of the challenges of implementing the convention in the global context. And if you look in your, one of your handouts, you'll see that um, although I'm a visiting research fellow at the Open University, I've also been a consultant to UNESCO, developing some of the training materials for implementing the convention, and also running some capacity building work workshops in various countries. So some of what I'm saying comes from my experience looking at how the, com the convention is being implemented in different countries. Now, as you know, there are 163 state parties that have ratified the convention. So there's an, a lot of different experiences, including many experiences in Western Europe, which is called Group 1 under the UNESCO system. And these different experiences present a number of opportunities, but also a number of challenges. Now, Janet already mentioned some of those challenges. And I think it's really interesting to consider some of the specific themes of today's symposium in relation to the broader problematic of defining cultural practice as heritage. Because as Janet was saying, you know, intangible heritage has been going on for many centuries. Does one just leave it alone? <laughs> or does one somehow incorporate it into this understanding of what is heritage? And then involving the state, involving NGOs, and involving other actors. And I think that our themes, which I've highlighted in red here, identity, human rights, sustainable development, are linked to two ways of defining intangible heritage. The one is looking at the conceptual boundaries. Because the concept of intangible heritage is incredibly broad. Knowledge, practices, expressions, passed down through the generations, it could be anything. So one of the crucial areas at which the convention looks at a boundary to that is what is important to communities in terms of identity and continuity. And then we have what I've called backstop boundaries. Even though communities might really think something's important, if it involves human sacrifice or some other tradition that's a gross human rights violation, that's not going to be accepted at the international level on the lists. And equally, if you have a tradition that communities think is wonderful, but it completely ruins the natural environment, again, that's not going to be considered at the international level. And certainly at the national level in many states that have signed up to human rights instruments, uh, these things are also not going to be considered ICH at the national level. So with each of these, we have opportunities, and what comes with them is various challenges. And I've, I've identified four main opportunities. Affirming multiple cultural identities, this idea of being inclusive, expanding the boundaries of heritage, promoting community participation, promoting sustainable development, mutual respect, and human rights. So I'm going to go through these four and just summarize some of the key challenges. Your first inventorying exercise in Scotland, I thought was very exciting because what it did was it looked at not just Scottish ICH, but ICH in Scotland. And I think that's a very important uh, frame. And it's also very important, as Janet was saying, to use the ICH idea to highlight 
the importance and the contribution of uh, minority groups or new immigrants and maybe even the diaspora communities to some extent, although that becomes tricky under the convention sometimes to talk about other countries. But there are some challenges in using ICH as a marker of identity. And the one is that ICH isn't out there. It's not Smarties or M&Ms lying on the floor. It's a strategic decision how to identify it. And there is a tendency often to focus on national culture or ethno-linguistic communities as your definition of what is feasible as a community not perhaps looking at, as Janet was saying, religious identity or sexual orientation or gender identity, all these other ways of defining communities. And equally, there's a tendency to claim uniqueness and authenticity, because often what communities feel is part of their identity is what makes them special and unique, and they want to frame the ICH in that way. I think secondly, the focus of, on communities of practice. As Janet said, the convention highlights this importance of community participation, but it states parties at the international level who play that role of nominating to the lists, and who also are responsible under the convention for ensuring that inventorying takes place. I really like the way in which the Swiss inventory tries to also, on the one hand, show that traditional Swiss, Swiss culture is part of the ICH, playing the Alp horn, but also takes, a, pays attention to minority groups such as through the Jewish cultural heritage in Argyle, or changes the idea of what we see as ICH by moving away from the folklore traditions, looking at Appenzell humor and satire, and then finally, uh, even more intangibly, talking about the spirit of Geneva on its national inventory. And I think that what's very important is to try and broaden this idea of ICH so that one can involve as many communities as possible. The big challenge is this idea of how to develop models for community participation that respond to modern contexts as well as ICH safeguarding needs, and is specifically using the digital platforms. And so I think the work that you're doing here is very groundbreaking around the wiki and online inventories. But I think challenge still remains because so many organizations were founded, museums are, are, are some of them, with collections, heritage management around sites. And you have an existing mandate. How do you broaden that to look at intangibles? And I think one of the problems is that look at safeguarding ICH is not just about changing the label on the objects that you own. It's not just about doing oral history about your violin collection. It's about focusing on the practice of violin playing. And similarly with buildings and sites, it's not just about the intangible values, it's about the intangible practices for building those sites and for maintaining them and using them. The third opportunity is the opportunity to promote human rights. And Janet's already covered this quite a lot, so I'm just going to take one or two examples. Obviously, at the international level, this backstop boundary of human rights has been delicate because countries have different definitions. And that's why I put the bullfighting picture here. Most of the debates about human rights at the international level have actually been about animal rights. And the, the, the other issue that's been covered most is this question of mutual respect because no one yet has, promoted, uh, has proposed a gross human rights violation as an element to the international lists. But I think the main challenge around the human rights issue is the fact that individuals are given the right to opt out of cultural practices, but, no, but they often then suffer the consequences if they opt out. 
It doesn't offer a support to them after opting out. And I think that's a fundamental tension about the way in which cultural rights and human rights exist in tension. It's not something that the convention can resolve. Equally, it's very difficult to change cultural practices by banning them. And sometimes, putting tricky cultural practices that have some human rights issues onto a, some kind of an inventory can help to promote discussion. And some countries have chosen to do that. Obviously, if something that is um, offensive to some communities in the countries is on a national inventory, I think that's sending the wrong signal. But you don't need to have only one inventory in a country. You can have a number of different inventories. And then finally, this fourth opportunity to promote sustainable development. Now, a number of speakers, including Rita May, have already discussed some of the sustainable development issues. What are the challenges? The one challenge, and I've been working a bit on some materials for policy development around ICH, one of the big challenges is that there isn't very good integration into development uh, policies. And sometimes that integration is simply saying, look, ICH can make money, which is fine. There isn't a lot of discussion about what is the meaning of over-commercialization. If you read the operational directives that Janet mentioned, you'll see there's something <coughs> saying, there's a warning against over-commercialization of ICH. But what does that actually mean? Can we not start talking, not just about this one single linear continuum of uh, commercialization, non-commercialization, and over-commercialization, but some more detailed discussion about where do the rights sit? Who makes decisions? Who benefits? How is the process related to the natural, normal, previous ways in which this was transmitted? Some ICH practices have always been about selling a product. That's what's kept them going, right? So it's very much about what the ICH is and what the specific threats that it faces. And in this regard, I think there's not enough attention to looking at intellectual property rights and how that intersects with intangible heritage. To conclude, intangible heritage is not a thing. It's something that's identified by different groups of people, different stakeholders with particular interests, including communities of practice to identify it as heritage. And states also have particular interests in identifying something as heritage, whether for nationalistic purposes or others. And each of these groups is not monolithic. The state is not monolithic. The private sector is not monolithic. And so when we look at the challenges of implementing the convention, we look at trying to prioritize the identification and safeguarding of ICH by communities without appropriating it for any of these other stakeholder groups. And it's difficult to find a way of doing that, but I think the experiences of states' parties so far have taken a step in the right direction. Obviously, there are some states that are, that are interested in appropriating heritage. But I think the majority of states are trying to find ways around this and to find ways of moving forward. So I think um, that this will be a, um, a way of starting that conversation at, in, in Scotland um, at the national level. So to conclude, there are opportunities that the convention presents, and in some states, I think, have not taken advantage of those opportunities. But there are many ways to shift the discourse around heritage through the convention, 
And I think we need to start talking very frankly about the, what those challenges are in order to develop a way forward that is not appropriating of intangible heritage. Thank you very much. Namaste and a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ananya from Calcutta in India and I thank Majorney and Museum Gallery Scotland for giving me the opportunity to share our experience in this beautiful symposium. Um, what uh, I'll uh, focus on is uh, more on the sustainable development angle and also touch on human rights and identities, which are the key themes. Now, we have been talking about development, and as you see in the even declaration, right from the beginning, there has been a focus on participation. And thankfully, since maybe since 90s, there has been a shift in the development paradigm. So from an investment in infrastructure, from a focus on, you know, uh, on a, a focus on a forced down approach, it has been changed to values and it has been changing to participation. So development paradigm has been shifting. And intangible cultural heritage offers new opportunities. So what I'll do in the next few minutes is I'll share the experiences we have related to culture and development and the working models which have been tested out and we have been working with and how it has impacted identity and rights issues. To give you a background, our organization is a social enterprise. So we came here from a development perspective. So we work for equitable development and what we found is that in India, we have these indigenous communities who have a rich heritage of performing arts, oral traditions, traditional craftsmanship, knowledge of nature, which are not recognized in the formal developmental paradigms. So what happens is a singer who might be knowing 500 songs and singing stories with philosophies on human relations is treated as uneducated because he's illiterate. So our if initiative is known as Art for Life, where we targeted developing sustainable livelihood options out of the art skills in the communities. And we started with 3,000 folk artists in Eastern India, in the state of West Bengal. And today we have covered more than 10,000 families in the two Eastern Indian states of Bihar and West Bengal. So you see, we have been working for now 10 years and that's from where our, my experiences are from. Now, if we talk of economics and production, we, what do we say? Production is factored by land, labor, and capital. Now, intangible cultural heritage relates very well to this. See, our heritage, as we have already discussed and the previous speakers have mentioned, it's very much determined by the place where we are living in, right? It's just as natural resources are part of land. Our cultural resources are also defined by the place where we are living and leading our lives. And capital, in the conventional sense, capital, we talk about the tools and the machineries where investments are needed. But here, capital is the cultural wealth which is there in the embedded in the skills of the communities. And the people, they themselves are the practitioners, so they are the labor. And the fourth factor is entrepreneurship. It's a successful entrepreneur who manages the land, labor, and capital to build enterprise, right? So here also, cultural entrepreneurship or creative industries, they have the potential. They have the potential to use this resource, which is not used really in many places that way, to develop new areas of enterprise addressing issues of socioeconomic empowerment of people. So off to some examples. Now this is a village, I don't know whether you can see it clearly, but there are some metal crafts in the front. It's a lost wax method, which is a very old method. You know, gypsies or roaming communities, they had that. So what they do is they made, make a mold of wax and they pour metal, molten metal in it. and Used. Traditionally, they used to meet, make grain measures and anklets and things like that. This craft is known as dokra in India. 
and these nomadic tribes have now settled down, and they're extremely poor. So this village is one of 50 families, and even two years back, you know, that village was known as the village of the drunkards, because these people, they used to make the dokra craft, and it, it involves, you know, working in the furnace, so they had to withstand that heat, and uh, end of the day, they used to drink, the women were not literate, and no one went to the village. So there was really no respect for the craftspersons. The Dokra is a much coveted and much internationally publicized craft of India. So what happened in the last two years we have been working, we focused on those issues also, on the issues of you know, women empowerment, getting them involved, on the issues of stopping alcoholism. And today, you know, just last month, the village for the first time held a festival where people came and many people from the surrounding places entered the village for the first time. And they said, even a doctor, a local doctor, he said, you know, I come here always to you know, save the people from you know, dying conditions and you have changed the village. So their craft led to the change. Only what was different, previously they were working as wage laborers. Dokra was being made for the last decades, many, many decades, but no one was giving respect to the craftsperson. So that's where we have to be very conscious in our approaches, in our policies, that you know, the human rights is also all about human respect, and that is often what goes missing. So from the 3,000 artists we started with, when we started, in terms of Indian rupee, they did not even earn 500 Indian rupee which is like, uh, you can say, five pounds a month. Today, the average income in pounds will be like 40, while with 10% of them, they're earning more than 150 pounds a month. So their income has increased many fold. But that is not the only thing. The main thing is they're enjoying the respect and recognition. I'm not sure whether you can read the impacts, but what has happened is not only economic improvement, but they are now more interested to participate in the local development process. Previously, they were alienated from the development process. Now they're asking for roads, they're asking for electricity, they're, uh, they're sending their children for education to school. There is greater value of education. In Indian, many discourses, often it is said that these marginalized communities, they're uneducatable and unemployable. Why? because the parents don't have a value for the children's education, they won't send children to school, and they don't have the skills to employ them. So that has been the shift which our effort has brought over. So there is the, all the children in these families where we work, it's, I'm talking of 10,000 families today, they're going to school. The people have installed toilets at home. India, as you may be aware, 60% of Indians still difficult in the open. It's a national shame for us but they learn the value of sanitation through the process. And in one of the other villages where they make terracotta, when we started two years back, there were 90% houses were without toilets. And today, all the houses have toilets. So we never told them to install a toilet at home. But, you know, the cult, with their culture, when we opened up the world to them through exhibitions, through festivals, through participation in different events, they learned about the world. As people appreciated their art, they also start, their self-esteem, their self-respect improved. And you know what happened in the end result? They started appreciating the developmental goals too. So there is improved sanitation, there is improved quality of life. And as you know, most of the traditional bearers are women. And these women who are in many cases, they were restricted to go out of the house. And now they're traveling to Europe, they're traveling to various places in Asia, showcasing their art form. So gender mobility has come. One of, you know, Indian embroidery is famous. So one of the embroidery styles we were working with, women did not again earn more than five pounds a month. It's called kantha, it's a run stitch, it's a quilting technique, it's a wonderful embroidery. And on an average, uh, um, maybe a stole will cost around 5,000, which is like a 50 pounds, but they earn peanuts. So what we started there is, we started their teaching about business process, and in that business process, we gave them the knowledge and the confidence to work as an enterprise, to source their material, to go to the bag. We even taught how to go and talk to the bankers. We use theater, because these women were not educated, so we use 
Bangla is Bengal and Natak is theatre, so we use theatre for life skill development. And so today these women, their income has again increased from 500 to 5,000 rupees a month, only within two years. So poverty is really not a lack of skill here. What was poverty here? The lack of opportunities. And building on intangible cultural heritage opened up that opportunity. Now, one thing I'd like to mention from our learning, livelihood is really not equal to additional income generation only. It is our income is, of course, important, but what is more important is engagement. So when we are talking of developing sustainable livelihood create, or creative industries out of ICH, this is something which is very important to remember. We worked with traditional storytellers who paint long scrolls with natural color and sing them. And we had a partnership with London Metropolitan University. And those students, when they went in, they found that they were just using poster and acrylic colors. So what they did is they sat with the families, and there were only two, three persons at time who remembered how the natural colors were met. And they documented all that. And the community, again, started using it. And the beauty of natural color is, as the scrolls grow older, they become brighter. Okay, so that got revived. This dance form is Chow Dance. It's inscribed in the UNESCO representative list. It's a very vigorous acrobatic dance, and it's a male dance. What happened? Chow Dance got revived. The Chow Dancers were going everywhere, and the young girls in the villages, they said, we'll also dance. And today, there are two women Chow Dance teams. So, you know, we are talking about how to engage the young people, or how to get their interest. Once we develop this, it's not about income here, but it's about aspirations. So the young people find new uh, that I can become an artist, I can become a star. So that aspiration drives it. So it's not always the income factor. Bangla, Kawali, and Potirgan, these are some of the documentations. Today, uh, two speakers shared about participatory inventory. Now, what had happened to the Chow dance, for example, it was acrobatic and they forgot the original dances and just the jumping remained. Then the older dancers, they sat with the community, with the documenting specialists, and they documented the older steps. Then the skill development workshops were held, and you know, they emulate the movement of snake, they emulate the movement of monkey, all those styles were lost, so those were brought back. The storytelling songs were documented, Kawali, most of you may have heard of Kawali. It's a group singing, and there was a form called Bengali Kawali, which is in Bangladesh, West Bengal area. Now, the <coughs> fakirs who sing this, they are the Sufis of Bengal, they are very ostracized because they don't follow the conventional notions of Islam. They're followers of Islam, but they don't ascribe to the conventional pathways, so they're ostracized. They were, children were not allowed to school, they were not allowed to sing together, so Kawali was lost. Now, in this revival process, they again started singing Kawali because they could again assemble together, as uh, Janet very rightly pointed out, often they don't even have the scope of assembling together. So when they got that opportunity, they again revived the Kawali, and the whole thing was documented. So these are the examples where, you know, the impact is the youth got engaged, the art form got revived, the lost traditions were revived. So these were the effects. So what our surmise or learning is that culture, ICH, needs investment because that skill, as I explained in that land, labor, capital and enterprise theory, it leads to resource generation in the community for new developments. And that's where, you know, what was just a dance or an oral tradition or a craft creates resource for the entire community to develop. So often we say that will there be a conflict if one group goes forward. Say if there is cultural tourism, then there is a sharing of benefits. The women, the disabled, the young people, they have other income opportunities from the hospitality services. Then as their identity gets strengthened, as they understand that my culture is being respected and recognized, what happens? They start taking interest in the development process, which has an impact on the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And of course, 
Once that pride comes in, the interest to safeguard, the interest to participate, that also comes in. So we see that, you know, what is the role here of ICH? It helps to create an enabling ecosystem for sustainable development. Museums play a very important role here. What we have done in this process, we have set up almost 10 what we call resource centers, art resource centers, but these are what we can say community museums or living museums, which provide the community a valuable space to practice and to learn. So this is where it is strengthening transmission, where people from outside are going. So you see there are various, one is dance, this is song, that is the scroll painting resource center, and in the, these two are the oldest, and every weekend now there are visitors to the village of the scroll painters. And the painters say, you know, the children, every Saturday morning, they will sit down with their crayons and paper, saying that someone will come and they will see us painting. So see, the children are also taking pride in their art form. And so it has become a very important, the museums are important for transmission, for creating an identity, creating a brand for the village, and of course, you know, setting that very impactful cycle. I'll just take you on a tour. So this is the Patachitra Museum. We got EU fund to set up the initial ones and now the government in our state, they have uh, put it in their policy. So they're building them in the villages where there are 50 or 100 families practicing art form. So this is uh, Baul Fakiri. So what has happened, we have developed a calendar of festivals. It's a fixed calendar. So in some villages, it's now in the sixth year, in some it's in the second year. I've left some brochures with a calendar and I invite all of you. The festivals are between November and March. Every weekend, one village has a festival. So what we found, you will see how the everyone, the children, the women, everyone is involved. And we found that even the local people were not aware of the art form. And through the festivals, local awareness, local recognition got created. So identity is at individual level, is at a local, national and international level. This festival, we had someone from Colombia and I asked, how did you learn about it? He said, I, uh, I heard from someone in Europe. So you see, that's how powerful today's ICT is. We have a festival, Holi you must be knowing, is a festival of colours. So there were three persons from Malaysia last year. So I said, how did you know about this? They said, it's called the best folk holy in India. So you see, it's a very organic system this ICT provides through which awareness gets created. So festivals are extremely important. One, it gives a context for renewal performance. It might be dying. Say, for example, we have a mass dance tradition. And maybe just two years back, we found five, or not even five groups were there and it was a dying heritage. We were working on the craft of the mask tradition. Then in this festival, that dance also got revived, and people go. So you see it is providing a new context, and as I said, it creates a brand, and the larger community is impacted. The other thing we have been discussing today is accepting the other, whose heritage? Who decides what's the heritage? Huh. I was looking for you. <laughs> that I to see the time. Jump yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So there also festivals play a very important role. We have a festival called Sufi Sutra, which is a peace music festival. This is in the sixth year. And I'm happy to share that Cherry Grove from Scotland will be performing in the festival next year. The, as the people, they go abroad, or the people from outside come in, they build their own networks. And not only the confidence part and the self-esteem part, but what happens is innovations as they interact. That's why, you know, in our policies, we should have exchange and collaboration put in, because that creates new innovations. ICH is threatened, it's very fragile. But, you know, once we open up the world, why is it fragile? Because they've been cut out shut out from the modern globalized development. So that kind of uh, reinforces the thing. So this is a very small clip where it shows a team from Wales 
and the team, the Baul and Fakirs, they are kind of performing together. So this is the resource center where these music teams, they just find their way. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that the two areas I think such knowledge forums and networking is important. One is to build evidence because we know as a sustainable development goals have been announced and culture is there and not there. It could have been more explicit, but it's not that explicit. So maybe we need to build evidence and there all of us, academics, NGOs, Communities need to work together. The other is the legal framework part. I think a lot is missing there. We have laws to protect our collections, laws to protect our built heritage, but really not enough laws for the intangible. I think these are the two areas where we'd like to really work together and develop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. So hold some of those thoughts and a, a quick tour around India. That was fantastic. Um, next up is Simon Hayhow, a little bit closer to home as the director of the Scottish Fisheries Museum. And he's going to tell us about the museum's work with the coastal rowing communities, um, the boat building initiative. Simon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to Joanne and MGS for supporting some of the projects that we've been doing. And I'm going to take you through um, two, two projects. One was small but engaged the community and I think we learned an awful lot from it. The second one started as a small project but has grown arms and legs and um, I'll say a bit more about that afterwards. Do I, do I press? Just press it. Right. right. Okay, just to give you a little introduction, um, obviously um, the Scottish fishing communities are very rich uh, in their oral traditions, rituals, superstitions, music. A lot of the skills that are passed on relate to the design of boats, building boats, and how to handle boats. And... Um, Lots of areas like the um, oral tradition of passing on um, patterns of knitting ganses and things like that. Probably um, it's the hazards of the occupation that, that mean that superstitions are quite prominent. Um, and that's always one of the most popular areas of the museum. And I haven't got time to go through everything, but examples are particular words which um, you, know, you just don't utter when you're on a fishing boat. Uh, minister, you always call them a black coat. Pig, you call a curly tail. And you never say salmon, you say red fish. So that's just the sort of a, a flavor of uh, sort of uh, superstitions that uh, involve the fishing communities. Um, for those who don't know, this is uh, the Reaper. And we have a collection of 20 um, full-size fishing boats. Reaper was um, operational in the heyday of the fishing industry, the, uh, the herring fishing, and um, it's a very important part of our outreach that she goes and visits uh, former ports that were, were part of the herring fishing. Uh, this, this particular image is quite significant today. This was um, when uh, she, everything sort of came right. She's operated by a team of volunteers and, of course, they, they're not operating her as much as, you know, the fishermen would have done. They take her out perhaps every other weekend during the summer. But this is when everything came together and they came back really on a high that they'd, everything uh, had, had sort of working efficiently. And this was part of a flotilla up in the Moray Firth. Uh, and luckily, one of the other boats, the Isabella Fortuna, had someone taking photographs. And Reaper started at the the back of the flotilla, and she just sailed past everybody there. So this is her working at her maximum. But I think it shows that, yeah, even though we know how to operate her, we, we, you know, the skills to, to operate her at her maximum capacity um, perhaps have been, you know, starting to be lost. The first project that I want to mention is something that we did called Home from the Sea. And this was also us trying to take the collection out into the community. Um, what we did was ask for different households to be part of a project and become 
community curators. And we provided a whole series of resources for them. This is, hopefully you can see on the left, there's people working in the library there. But they had access, and they had to pick a photograph, an object, and then they would, they would tell the story to the public on one special night in uh, March, a couple of years ago. So this is everybody researching, and different people focused on different things. So we weren't prescriptive. It was, what, it was the story that they wanted to draw from either the photograph or the object, or perhaps from their home. A lot obviously researched the history of the house and who'd lived there. But some were inspired by the photographs, um, there was a Tahitian princess who came to live in Amsterdam. The one lady adopted that. Um, and, and this is on the right, you can see it's a bit dark on this image. But um, as I say, one night in, in March, um, everybody came together for a walking exhibition through the streets of Saladite, which is the, uh, the, the fishing community next to Amsterdam. And they could identify the buildings because they had an illuminated, you can see an enlarged image in the window there. And each of the households had selected objects from the museum. There were obviously issues around that, but that gave us an opportunity to explain about museum cataloguing, handling, environmental conditions. Um, here you can see um, somebody who was very into craft work selected uh, a net braiding needle, and on the right, um, there was a house that was formerly part of a brewery, and uh, we had a, a beer bottle in the collection, and you can see this is the owner explaining all about the history to, to visitors. Uh, so I think we unlocked a whole series of fascinating stories uh, just by providing a few quite simple objects. The second project I want to mention, and this is Janet earlier, and various people have mentioned uh, co Scottish coastal rowing. This is something that, that really uh, developed far beyond what we expected. Coastal rowing is not unique to Scotland, but um, this particular project has, has really um, grown. Oops, sorry. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with that image uh, that was selected for the the front cover of the National Strategy. Um, that, that's actually our over 40s ladies team racing the under 40s. Uh, you can't see them, but uh, um, this, this, is, uh, this is how the project originated. We, we were trying to keep alive some of the boat building skills, um, and we thought it's probably a big step to start building boats from scratch. So we knew somebody who operated, um, who manufactured kits. So based on a, a model in the collection uh, of this Fair Isle skiff on the left, we gave it our own modern twist and we developed a St. Isles skiff, St. Isles being the name of the chapel on which the museum uh, is built. And from that, this whole project has, has grown. Um, and, and a Scottish coastal rowing project has developed. Um, we've had lots of publicity. Um, it's really captured uh, the community spirit, really. And um, we've been featured on BBC Country File, Landward, and a lot of uh, articles written. Um, in the early days, we even took one of the skiffs inside the Scottish Parliament to try and get political support. And certainly in Fife, that helped because grants were made available to any community that wanted to develop a project. And I'll say too much about the, uh, the building of the, uh, the project, but the fact that the, the kits are quite um, affordable for a community to purchase and with a little bit of expertise, um, they can actually build them themselves. So that's quite different to some of the other projects around uh, Britain, such as you know, the Cornish gigs, which are quite expensive, and you wouldn't expect to, to build those. So a community can follow the whole project through from fundraising, building the boat, and, uh, and then following on to racing it. Um, as I say, this, this is a whole aspect that we hadn't 
envisaged, we thought there might be a few, you know, local uh, towns that would, would, would build boats, but this is developed and looking at the Scottish Coastal Rowing site, yesterday there's 140 boats registered, but we know that another 100 kits have been sold. And not only um, in Scotland, it's starting to, to develop in England now, and it even has an international dimension. Uh, on the left, this is a Scottish team who took a boat uh, to the Vogalonga, which is a a boat procession in Venice, but uh, you can see that, um, that the project has developed um, in other countries and uh, there's um, around 15 boats in USA and other boats in um, Australia, New Zealand, Holland. We've even got world championships it was held in 2013, and the next one will be next year in Stranford Lock in Northern Ireland. This is how we hope to continue the project. Um, there's two, two particular aspects. One is a ship-shaped project where we take trainees in conjunction with National Historic Ships, and they get experience on a number of different historic vessels, and then they come to the museum. At the bottom is our Leonardo on the left here is uh, leading our boat building project. And it's quite important that we link up the Scottish Maritime, have an academy, and the Galgale Trust. This photo on the bottom right is the Galgale Trust visiting. So I just want to um, show you this project, which, uh, which is a film that has arisen from the... Um, the initiative, the boat building. And I'll just read you, it's by somebody called Neville Gaby, and um, he's a well-known sculptor and filmmaker. And he says, uh, yes, it is about building a boat and rowing on the sea, so there is a narrative. But my interest was deeper than that. The skiff provided the narrative for me to immerse myself in the tiny settlement of Coigach, which is uh, up in the northwest of Scotland in Westeros and to consider the powerful symbiotic relationship between a community and a very particular environment. So he's made a film about this, and uh, that's all I've got to say, but I'll leave you with this two minute. This is a trailer for the film, but hopefully it gives you a little flavor of how this project can form the focus for community involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Can I have all three speakers up on the stage? We're going to do a very quick Q&A. We've got very little time, but um, we'll have a quick go. I've got two questions here from uh, online. I'll take one of them, and then I'll take one from the floor. This is a question for Harriet. How does the work you are involved in overlap in practice with human rights organization, organizations, e.g. those working against child marriage in, um, or uh, female um, genital mutilation? Um, this is from Gerlock Museum, who are watching online. Uh, thanks for the question. I hope this mic is still situated. Yeah. Um, the, the convention is not a human rights instrument, and I think that uh, although at the international level it's very much part of the UN stable that's promoting human rights, um, it cannot enforce uh, human rights uh, principles in different parts of the world. And I think that the way this work relates is that it raises the issue at the international level, that some kinds of cultural practices actually are problematic in terms of human rights. And it creates opportunities for discussions on how to resolve that. But it does not enforce certain human rights principles. And I think it's very important for 
states parties that have signed up to these human rights instruments to actually actively enforce them, because a lot of states that sign up to the human rights instruments actually do not. And if you look at their constitutional provisions, they, they often say, well, we're not going to bother with this in a certain cultural area. And I think that that's where a lot of campaigning needs to happen. So we raise awareness about that. But where the enforcement needs to happen is at the national level in terms of the human rights instruments. Okay. Any more questions from the floor for our speakers? Okay, I've got one more one on, from online. And again, it's, it's Harriet, but I think anybody. Um, what mechanisms for non-state representations might there be for ICH communities? And this is from Simon McNell, again, watching online. Um, at the international level, and uh, a couple of people have alluded to this already, there is an accreditation process for NGOs, and uh, th there's also a role for NGOs in some of the evaluation bodies. And community organisations can apply to be accredited as NGOs. So that's one role. But there isn't a kind of specific role for community representatives in the committee meetings or the General Assembly in the UNESCO frame. But uh, what community representatives can also do is they can actually comment on pending nominations online. This is a new system that's come into play in the last few years, and it creates an opportunity, for example, if a community wants to object to an element that the their state party is proposing for the international list, they can actually comment online, and then the state party has to respond to that. I've got a question for Ananya. As all the um, different aspects of sustainable development start to emerge through your projects from a starting point of empowering people in terms of income generation from the craft, how have you captured um, the outcomes and put, woven that into your methodology going forward? To capture the outcomes, we have done periodic surveys and studies to assess, so if that is a question. Uh, we have collected the case studies and also done uh, quite exhaustive uh, inline studies and midterm studies. And we always incorporate the learning. For example, the festival. This is something which we found that it worked. And the main thing which has happened is, you know, the first time we started, as I said, in 2005, and it took us five years, around 2010 we reached somewhere. But the craft communities I just shared, we started working less than two years before. But we have now developed a model which is giving, because we know that this works. So we are trying it out. Of course, it is changing from community to community, but it has, that learning has helped to improve and, you can say, strengthen the process. And just a quick question for Simon. In terms of um, the future now, you've got all these um, rowing communities out there. Is there a network? Do they communicate? And how does the museum interact with that network? Um, there, is, there is a whole uh, Scottish Coastal Rowing Association which obviously gets involved with the more competitive side of it. I and mean, we, we're trying to keep our involvement. For instance, the, the World Championships, we, we actually... Um, provided the, the winning trophy and we're putting more interpretation in the museum about that because we don't want people to forget where it started from. So, uh, but, it, but it sort of got its own life as far as coastal rowing has gone and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, regulations which uh, are sort of outside the museum's remit but we keep a presence on the committee and uh, as I say we try and um, represent uh, the, the, the origins of the boat. And we actually purchased the prototype boat so that that will always be part of the museum collection. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, everybody.